Let's briefly review Lewis structures now and talk about the shorthand that organic chemists use to represent Lewis structures containing a large number of atoms and a good deal of structural complexity. So let's return to the idea of drawing Lewis structures. And the first thing I want to say about this is that this is really a process, not an algorithm. If you got the idea from introductory chemistry that drawing Lewis structures based on a formula is, for example, a deductive algorithm where we can apply a series of steps and always arrive at the same Lewis structure. Hate to break it to you, but you got the wrong idea. This is more of a process. It's a error-prone sequence of steps that we take to convert a formula into a Lewis structure. Where the error generally tends to lie is in the first step, which involves drawing what we call a sigma skeleton. The sigma skeleton shows how the atoms are connected to each other through sigma bonds. The sigma skeleton consumes or uses up the sigma electrons in the molecule. The question of what makes a reasonable sigma skeleton is actually a really good question, and there are a few general rules that we can use to think about this. In general, we find less electronegative atoms near the center of Lewis structures because they tend to form more bonds. They have a higher what's called valence, and so we find them near the center where they can form a lot of bonds to atoms with smaller valence. We can use the way the formula is written as a guide, and you'll start recognizing patterns here. Patterns like CH3, indicating three hydrogens bound to a carbon. NO2, indicating two oxygens bound to nitrogen. And even patterns in the way parentheses are used, like CHOH, indicating a carbon bearing a hydrogen and a hydroxyl group. Once we have what we think is a reasonable sigma skeleton down, we move to adding multiple bonds and lone pairs to the structure until we've satisfied the octet rule and all the valence electrons are used up. So here, for example, we might add a lone pair to this atom, a multiple bond here, maybe a triple bond here, something like this, until we've satisfied the octet rule on every atom and all the valence electrons are used up. And what this means is that the total valence electron count for all of the atoms in the structure is equal to the sum of the sigma electrons, the electrons in the sigma skeleton, and the pi and non-bonding electrons that we find in lone pairs and pi bonds. We then add formal charges based on the formal electron count of each atom relative to the valence electron count of the neutral atom. And we'll talk a little bit more about how to engage this process in a later video. And then finally, we check that the total number of electrons really is equal to the sum of the valence electron counts of all the atoms, and, and this is an important piece that's not on the slide, we also need to consider the overall charge of the molecule in counting up the number of valence electrons. If the charge is negative, we need to add electrons, and if it's positive, we need to take electrons away. So considering the overall charge is very important here as well. This last check is really important because it provides us with that evaluation step in the reasoning process that allows us to potentially revisit step one if needed to generate a new sigma skeleton. So really you should think about drawing Lewis structures as an iterative process where when you get to the end you want to evaluate is the octet rule satisfied, does the structure make sense, and is the structure reasonable. And quite often you'll need to do this evaluation on Lewis structures that you're looking at or that you've drawn yourself based on given Lewis structures, not for the molecule as a whole, but for specific regions of interest within a molecule. And so this evaluation or this check is really important, particularly for shorthand, which we'll move to in the second half of this video. We alluded to this already, but there are multiple ways we can think about counting electrons in Lewis structures depending on the concept or idea that we're working with. We're going to use two different counting schemes for different purposes. The so-called formal electron count, which is used to deal with formal charge, and the so-called total electron count, which is used to assess the octet rule. The formal electron count is defined as the formal number of electrons belonging to an atom assuming equal sharing. And by equal sharing, we mean we're going to take each bond between two atoms, let's say A and B, and split it in half so that one electron goes to each atom and count the electrons this way. So in this hypothetical molecule, A has one electron, B has one electron. So we don't double count. To determine the total electron count around an atom, we actually count each pair of bonding electrons twice. 
So we take AB and we imagine A has a pair of electrons and B has a pair of electrons. Now, it seems like electrons have come out of thin air, but for the purposes of the octet rule, it's okay to double count electrons like this. So as an example, we can look at the formal electron count in the ammonium ion to calculate formal charge. We think about this central nitrogen atom as having four electrons, one each from its four bonds to the hydrogen atoms, and the hydrogen atoms themselves have one electron each. So what we do to generate the formal electron count is we split those bonds in half, giving one electron to each of the atoms involved, and then we compare the electron count of each atom to the valence electron count of the neutral atom. If you examine the periodic table, you'll see that nitrogen ordinarily has five valence electrons. It's in group 15. And here the nitrogen has four. And so its formal charge here is plus one because it has one fewer electron in this structure than the neutral atom does. Each of the hydrogens has one valence electron. And hydrogen as a neutral atom has one valence electron. And so the charges on the hydrogens are zero, and we typically don't represent this using anything special. We just leave a charge off. And so the molecule as a whole would be drawn with the formal charge near the nitrogen atom, something like this. The total electron count is used to assess the octet rule. In other words, it's used to evaluate whether the octet rule is satisfied on every atom within a structure. So in applying this analysis to ammonium, we're actually going to give two electrons to the central nitrogen atom per bond that it has, and look at the number of electrons around the nitrogen to determine the so-called total electron count. And we're going to do the same thing with the hydrogens, giving them two electrons per bond that they're involved in so that each hydrogen is associated with two electrons now for the purposes of total electron count. So if we focus on the nitrogen, what we find now is that the total electron count is eight, and each of the hydrogens has a total electron count of two. And so while the nitrogen is obeying the octet rule, the hydrogens are actually exceptions to the octet rule. And we'll talk more about the octet rule and its exceptions here in a second. The octet rule says that the total electron count, as we defined it on the last slide, tends to be eight for atoms in organic structures. There are a few important exceptions to the octet rule, and these are situations where atoms have a total electron count very different from eight. Recognizing these exceptions is very important for a couple of reasons, one of which I'm going to touch on on this slide. So the first is hydrogen, and we've seen this already. Hydrogen tends to form only one bond. In fact, in all of the structures we'll see in this course, hydrogen forms one and only one bond. And so its total electron count from the perspective of the TEC as we defined it on the last slide is only two. This is fine for hydrogen because it's a first row element. It only needs two electrons to complete its valence shell. Neutral gr group 13 atoms are another famous case of exception to the octet rule, and these have six total electrons according to our convention. So the classic examples are, for example, boron and aluminum. Third row elements and below can have total electron counts that are greater than eight, sometimes not always. So sulfur, for example, and sulfuric acid is a nice example of this. If we decompose the sulfuric acid molecule according to our typical scheme for calculating total electron count, what we find is that the sulfur has two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve electrons around it. Count the total number of bonds here. One, two, three, four, five, six times two is a total electron count of twelve. And that is a crazy violation of the octet rule. But for third row elements and below, this is okay. The last example I'll mention is carbocations and carbenes, important intermediates in organic chemistry. These are actually analogous to the group 13 elements in a way that we'll explore in much more detail in a later lesson. Um, but these have six electrons around a carbon atom, either with positive charge, and this is isoelectronic to the group 13 boranes and aluminum compounds. And the carbene is a carbon with four formal electrons, four electrons in terms of valence electron count, but only two bonds. An important thing to note about these species, the 
atoms with six total electrons, such as the carbocations, carbenes, and the group 13 atoms, is that these are often reactive. And they're often reactive in the sense that they want to accept a pair of electrons onto the atom with only six total electrons on it. So all three of these can accept electrons in this manner in reaction mechanisms. That reactivity is something to pay attention to as we get into talking about reaction mechanisms later in the semester.